Hello, this is Dr. Ed Derner from the Department of Plant Biology at Rutgers. And today I'd like to talk to you about flower mapping. The whole idea is to get an understanding of how you go from this, bug plants, or dormant crowns, to this. It all comes down to the meristem. The meristem is a group of cells where growth is taking place. The cells divide and take on different functions to produce new organs such as leaves or flowers. Meristems develop differently depending upon where they're located on the plant. There are two important types of meristems in a strawberry plant, terminal meristem and axillary meristems. Each crown of a strawberry plant has one terminal meristem and several axillary meristems. There's an axillary meristem in the axle of each leaf. So the number of leaves you have will let you know how many axillary meristems you have. The terminal meristem can remain dormant, it can produce leaves, or it can become floral. The axillary meristem can remain dormant or produce two leaf primordia, which in essence is a two node branch crown. There are two nodes, two inner nodes, and two leaf primordia. Now it's what happens to this two node branch crown that really helps us understand what's happening out in your strawberry field. Now this two node branch crown itself can stay dormant. Both of the inner nodes on that two node crown can elongate and that forms a runner. Or neither inner node elongates and then we just say that it's a branch crown with two nodes. So it's dormant, it becomes a runner, or it remains as a branched crown. Now the branch crown with two nodes has a terminal meristem and two axillary meristems. It, in essence, again, is an independent crown. Now that terminal meristem can remain dormant, produce an inflorescence, or produce some leaves, and then an inflorescence. You also have the two axillary meristems, which can either remain dormant or each produce a two-node branch crown. And that two-node branch crown can remain dormant, can form a runner, or stay as a two-node branch crown with a terminal meristem and two axillary meristems. Now this process of branching can continue to produce a plant that has many branch crowns. Each branch would have a terminal meristem and axillary meristems. Those axillary meristems can become a runner or become a branch crown with two or more nodes. So you get this branching continually going on so you can get a plant with many, many branches. Ideally for the plastic culture system, you want a plant with the main crown and five or six branches. The thing to remember is that flowers are always from a terminal meristem. Whether it's the terminal meristem of the main crown or the terminal meristem of an axillary branch crown. So what controls the development of these meristems? Genetics and environment. The environmental cues include photoperiod and temperature. The genetics are what type of cultivar we're looking at. Classically, we've looked at June bearer, ever bearer, and day neutral cultivars. However, I think there's enough evidence in the literature that we should stop looking at our strawberry cultivars in these categories, but rather we should look at short day and long day cultivars. Now in order to understand long day and short day cultivars, you need to understand a little bit more about the stages of flowering. Now, in any flowering plant, there are essentially four different stages of flowering. Induction occurs in the leaves, and this is when the cue for switching from being vegetative to being floral is received. When the signal perceived during induction moves to the meristem, and you can start seeing physical changes at the meristem, we say we have initiation. Now when the different flowers of an inflorescence or the different parts of an individual flower begin to develop, that's what we call differentiation. And when we get the actual macroscopic production of the flower cluster, either in the field or in the greenhouse or high tunnel, that's called development. Now short day cultivars form flower buds. They undergo flower bud induction and initiation when the day length is shorter than some critically defined value. And that critical value varies with cultivar within the short day cultivars and it's determined via research. Someone has had to study 
what the critical photo period for a particular cultivar is. It's not just something that would be known just offhand. Now, the important concept is that this critical value decreases as the temperature increases. So in other words, as it gets warmer out, the day length must be shorter in order for you to get flower buds to form in a short day cultivar. Now, the actual development of the flower cluster takes place under long days. On long day cultivars, flower bud induction and initiation occurs when the day length is longer than some critically defined value. Development also occurs under long days. And the important concept here, again, is to understand that the critical value of day length increases as the temperature increases. So as the days get warmer, the day length must become longer in order for flower buds to form in a long day cultivar. So in short day cultivars, that critical photo period gets shorter as the days get warmer. And in long day cultivars, that critical photo period gets longer as the days get warmer. Now, for both types of cultivars, there are two different types of responses to photo period. There's a quantitative response and a qualitative response. Now, a qualitative response is basically just like an on-off switch. Either the day length is short enough or long enough for flowering, depending upon whether you're talking about a short day cultivar or a long day cultivar. Now, the quantitative response is one where either you're giving the plants shorter photo periods or a greater number of photoperiodic cycles for a short day cultivar, or you're giving plants longer days for a greater number of photoperiodic cycles for long day cultivars. And the quantity of photoperiodic cycles that you give them, or the quality of the photoperiodic cycle that you're giving them, in other words, whether it's shorter than the required photoperiod for a short day cultivar, or longer than the requirement for a long day cultivar, that will determine how much flowering you get. So it's not, an, it's not a yes or no type of response, it's a quantitative response. So both of these types of responses are important for both different types of cultivars. Here's a graph showing you the short day cultivar response. Basically on the left we have day length, uh, looking at short days versus long days. And on the bottom axis we have temperature. What I'm trying to show here is that notice the black line with the red dots, that as the temperature gets higher and higher, the day length becomes shorter and shorter for you to get a flowering response. Notice that at temperatures below around 60, short day cultivars are basically insensitive to photo period, and at those temperatures, they truly could be called day neutral. However, once the temperature begins to rise, they begin to respond like a short day plant. That's why they're called short day cultivars. And there's the quantitative response, meaning the shorter the days or the greater number of cycles, you get more flowering. That occurs between 60 and say 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you get more of the yes, no type of response between 70 and 80. Now, many cultivars will not initiate flowers under short days, no matter how short they are, at temperatures above about 80 degrees. Now, in long day cultivars, it's kind of just the opposite. Uh, as the temperature gets higher, as you notice with the uh, black line with the green dots this time, as that temperature gets warmer and warmer, the day length requirement becomes longer and longer. The quantitative response occurs at a broader range now. Instead of 60 to 70 as it did for short day cultivars, you can go up to about 80 degrees and you're giving, getting a quantitative response the photo period in terms of flowering. Qualitatively, the effect is seen between 80 and 85. Above around 85 or so, long day cultivars will shut down, they'll stop flowering. Now, when you, when you compare the two side by side, the main thing to, to see is basically the difference in what's happening as the temperature gets warmer. Short day cultivars, the day length's getting shorter. Long day cultivars, the day length has to get longer to get flowering. And the temperature at which they make the switch from quantitative to, to qualitative is around 70 degrees in short day cultivars and about 80 degrees Fahrenheit for long day cultivars. There are a number of system components that impact the 
fate of your mirror stem on plants, but probably some of the more key components include cultivar, planting date, nitrogen fertilization, and row cover management. And with all of these, all four of these, flower mapping would be very beneficial for helping you make reasonable and hopefully better management decisions. In order to understand flower mapping, Pete Nietzsche and I have received a USDA SARE project from the Northeast region entitled Empowering Northeastern Strawberry Growers with Flower Mapping. And that's what I'd like to introduce to you today. It has two main components. One is a flowering and fruiting research component that Pete and I are conducting at Cream Ridge and Snyder Farm, where we're looking at fall nitrogen application and row cover management as it relates to flowering and production. The other component is teaching growers how to flower map, either in workshops, at grower meetings, or by virtual demonstrations. And I think this year they're going to be primarily virtually. Given the COVID situation still, I think that's the better option. Now, what is flower mapping? Flower mapping is a tool that enables you to determine whether or not your strawberry plants have set flower buds. Okay, why would you want to know when your flower buds have started to form? Well, if you know when your flower buds have started to form, you can better optimize planting date depending upon cultivar. It'll help you better manage nitrogen fertilization because nitrogen fertilization in the fall has a huge impact on flower formation. If you apply nitrogen too early, you can reduce flower formation. And if you apply it too late, you basically have no effect on flower formation. But if you apply nitrogen about a week after you've noticed the first signs of flower buds forming in the fall, you can greatly increase the number of flowers that are formed stem. In addition, you can improve your row cover management if you know whether you have branch crowns or not formed. Who is this project for? Any and all strawberry growers. I think any strawberry grower would benefit from being able to determine whether or not they have flower buds on their plants. The project's open to all strawberry growers in the Northeast region. However, our workshops are limited in size. If we have enough space available, we will certainly invite growers from other regions to participate in our workshops. Participants will be taught simple flower mapping techniques and asked to implement them on their farm. We'll provide a dissecting scope and a kit at no charge if we have enough funding for everyone. If we don't, only our growers in the Northeast will receive the free dissecting kit and scope. However, if other growers outside of our region wish to participate, they can purchase their own kit and scope for a total of about $50. The nice thing about the scope is that it's capable of taking pictures. Thus, you can email your pictures to us so that we can help you interpret your flower map and then perhaps make some recommendations based upon what we see. Your participation will require about an hour or so per week from August through December, for flower mapping and consultation. And you'll be expected to submit yield data to us so that we can evaluate the effectiveness of the technique. And we'll also ask you to evaluate the effectiveness of the workshop and also of the technique that you learn. Benefits to flower mapping is that you'll know the floral or vegetative status of your plants at any point during the production cycle. Your management decisions will be based on this knowledge, not on calendar dates or guesses. If you're interested, please contact me at this email address and we'll get things going for you. This is a short video of flower mapping. It's a little shaky because of the magnification. But at this point, we're just removing extra tissue around the terminal mirror stem of a strawberry crown. They were removing one of the leaf primordia. 
or actually it's actually a small leaf. It's not really a primordia at that stage. And right in the center, you can see the king flower of a inflorescence. And I will just clean that up a little bit. Okay, we're removing another leaf. And now you can see a, a leaf primordia to the right, right at the tip right there. And in the center was a king flower. Very delicate. Careful so you don't tear it apart. And there you see the king flower. And then just below that, to the left is the secondary flower. And then to the right of the secondary flower is probably the beginning of a tertiary flower. And I thank you for your participation. Have a great day.